Yeah, I guess we're rolling. Now don't cheat. No, I had to put the... You're cheating. The knight, I mean, the castle was in the wrong fucking you, spot. Every game you play, you, Shut you, have, to, up. you have to cheat. What, is, what kind of a move is that? I've never seen anybody with this some special move. I mean, this is the, your traditional opening move. I'm not a traditionalist. What do you think about Trump as our president? I think he's a great president. Yeah. I think he's just really a tremendous guy. Yeah. He's a transactional genius. Yeah. I'm glad you agree. So is it your move or mine? It's mine. Yeah, I think it's fascinating having a moron as <laughs> president of the United States. You swine. Do you think about these moves before you do them, or is this some sort of advanced strategy? What do you think about having Trump as a president? Well, I think that... Um, How did I ever let that happen? I think that... Um, <laughs> this is hilarious. I think that uh, David Donald Trump playing chess against Marco Rubio. Yeah. <laughs> so I've, I've had this. I've had this. Uh, God damn it! What are you doing anyway? Jesus! I don't know. You can checkmate me now, can't you? I mean, obviously, our political discourse is going to be far more astute than our chess playing. No, I think, uh, you know, in Jungian terms, that, that Trump is the personification of the shadow side of, of the American character. Everything that is nihilistic, self-centered, avarice, and, and selfishness focused. I guess that's redundant. Um, well, don't you think that's kind of the first layer of something? I mean, you get your... your uh, Avarice. Did, did you just move that? No, I just straightened it out. Don't touch. I would never, test, never test cheat test on you. Pieces. I would never, your never turn. cheat on you. Don't you think that there's a level of, <clears throat> that these are in levels? In other words, the flip, the flip side to Trump and his <clears throat> amorality is pragmatism. He's very pragmatic. He's not really pragmatic. He's totally impulsive. I mean, if you equate. Uh, yeah, but like, an, a, like, a an, like an amoeba, you know, if you stick a little electrode into the amoeba, I suppose that its reactive behavior is practical or pragmatic. And in that sense, he's, I suppose he's, he's pragmatic. If you poke him, he bleeds. He jumps. But he's easily taunted. I mean, he, again, he's, he's the quintessential ugly American. Everything about him is self-focused. He's the absolute corporeal manifestation of narcissism. Totally self-absorbed, completely incapable of empathizing with really any other human being. And I would think, you know, that would even include his children. And I guess we're going to have an opportunity to, to find that out, uh, when they are invariably indicted 
now that his charity has been closed, I think that New York State is probably going to wind up indicting Junior and um, Eric and Jared, his son-in-law, as well as Ivanka for their mismanagement of the, the Trump uh, charity. And I think he'll, he will go ballistic. And, and like any self-focused individual, any, you know, textbook um, sociopath, he will react accordingly. And I think that's probably what I fear the most is that he's already proven he'll do anything to distract attention and to get the next news cycle, right? I mean, what's the latest example of that? Everything went to shit last week. We're, we're, we're taping this on the 29th of December, which is a um, Saturday, Saturday before New Year's. And, and so in order to distract from all of the poop that hit the fan last week, he came up with this stupid, uh, okay, I'm going to withdraw from Syria. And... Uh, all of a sudden, everybody's talking about about that and the government shutdown because he doesn't want them talking about this other crap. Well, that's fine, but as far as any kind of strategic or even tactical thinking, I just don't think it's there. I just think he's reacting. You know, he's on camera, right? He invites the media in to have a conversation with, with um, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and right there on camera, he says, OK, if there's a shutdown, I'll own it. It's mine until we get what we want, he says, which I thought was just, again, the quintessential statement of, of the self-absorbed sociopath. Until we get what we want, I'll be I'll own the the. Uh, the shutdown. And of course, as soon as the shutdown occurs, then he claims it's the Democrats' fault, and he is such a pathological liar that he even, he even has the balls to say, which is easily verifiable is not true, he has the balls to say, well, I'm still in town negotiating, but the Democrats have left town. Well, that's just not what happened. And I think what he does is he counts on Fox News and his Twitter feeds to feed this false information to his base because he knows they're not going to check it out with anybody else. They're not going to go over to NBC or ABC or CNN and, and find out that there's actually something factually up, completely obtuse about what he's just claimed. And... So the base stays entranced, enamored, enthralled, I love that word, enthrall, in slavery to his mesmerization. And, uh, you know, there we are. Do you, do you believe in free will? I'm not at liberty to say. We have a pastor, pastor, people. And that's here. supposed to be a joke. That's pretty good. I'm not at liberty to say. Yeah. I know that's why I said. Whether you believe it in free will or not, that's, that was a that was I a know, that's, rejoinder. That's right? to be determined. <laughs> that's another <laughs> joke. Yeah. It's pretty good. Well, yeah, I don't think there's any proof for free will. I, I think that basically it's already happened. Whatever's happening has already happened. Well, it depends on the perspective from which you're viewing this. If you're in a God's eye mind of view, then everything is already, everything is happening all at the same time, past, present, and future. All right. So did you just move a piece? Yeah, I just moved this guy. If you can't keep up, let me know. We won't play anymore. <laughs> well, you're bringing out your night. So do you think that's a wise move? I don't know. I don't care. So... From a God's eye point of view, yeah, it's already happened, but God likes to, God's not, not a being, but let's just say God consciousness likes to play games, 
to amuse itself. So it separates off into these illusions of, of selfhood that are you and me and all of the other sentient beings that exist anywhere and plays these games where those little slices of its consciousness don't know what's going to happen. And then to make things even more interesting, I think what quantum physics is teaching us is that every time a decision is made, every time free will is exercised, that all of the alternatives to that choice are also manifested into a particular kind of reality so that every possibility is worked out on some chessboard somewhere. So in that regard, no, there wouldn't be any free will. And yet, from a different perspective, there is nothing but free will. Well, what, what really intrigues me about this thing with Trump is that if you look at his astrological chart, it's really unusual. I don't want to play this anymore. Go ahead. His astrological chart, what? What did you just do? I don't want to play anymore. I'm sick. What a, what a crybaby. Yeah, I am. <laughs> Can't wait. You, you come up against a better... A you, better won, okay? you, you won, You won. You won. That's all that's important. I didn't win anything. That's all important to you is you win. Yeah, but look who I won again. And that is the again, that's the, the heart of that's right, not trying to bring it back. Of a anything. totally self centered individual like Donald Trump. The only thing that matters <laughs> is victory. As fearic as it may be, as long as it appears to be a victory, even in only just this moment, <laughs> then that's all that matters. You're such a fucking jerk sometimes. Jesus Christ. And then he'll move on to the to the next thing. Well, you want to play again? <laughs> what Here. were we just doing? Well, well, we'll just start a new game. You don't have to be such a crybaby about it. Well, look who's been a crybaby. I mean, not got a chessboard over. Did he, did oh, I don't know. Him? It was just impulsive. I was doing my impersonation of Donald Trump. <laughs> That's what he does, is he just sweeps his hand across the board <laughs> And so says, okay, this is this is reality of, this is reality according to Trump, and that's the way it's gonna be. And the reason that that you know, I mean people he seems undefeatable is that people who usually think in, in, in a sort of linear or rational fashion have no idea what he's gonna do next. And yet, ironically, at the same time, everything that he does next is completely and utterly predictable. You go first this time. Well, you didn't set the chessboard up right. Wait a minute. What side does the king and the queen go on? You, you didn't set the chessboard up right. Shut up and tell me which side the king and the queen goes on. Queen on our own color. Queen on our own color. Well, okay. You see, you can't do anything without. So the that. so the queen is like each queen is opposite one another. But you can't play. You couldn't play chess. What is, what, what, you couldn't play chess with with uh, Donald because he would do something like what I just did. Or you just wouldn't play. Wouldn't see the point. Well, probably not. He wouldn't know how to play. I mean, if you're playing for a million dollars a piece, you know, or something like that. Yeah, he does. he's such a transactional kind of genius. But the, but the thing, just for money. But and the thing about it from a, the things. thing about it from a Jungian point of view is that we project, according to Carl Jung, we project our shadow material right onto others. So, really, while even anti-Trump people like me complain about this son of a bitch, really, what he is is he uh, he's projected his stuff out onto the nation. And we each take our own internal battle and we project it out onto and to Trump. He's just the perfect personification of the unwillingness or the inability yeah. of individual Americans well, to, to come to grips with those things that need to be worked out, you know, as the fundamental spiritual quandaries of the nation. Say that again. Trump is just bringing out what People need to work out. Is that what you just said? Yeah, absolutely. That's what I was about to say. That 
<laughs> Absolutely. There's no question about it. I listened to an interview this morning with John Kerry, you know, and he talks about what he's learned through the years, what what he garnered from his experience in Vietnam. And, and what we've done as a nation is we've never come to grips with certain mistakes that we've made. You know, it's the first step. It's the first step in recovery from any quandary is that you have to be willing to admit that a mistake has been made. You have to assume responsibility for what your part is in a given situation, even yeah. if it's only 1%. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. Which Donald has never done. Amen. He's, Amen, he's never done that. He's never accepted responsibility for anything. I remember at one point during the campaign, he was asked, you know, about... That's a very astute observation. About being an, about an apology. He's never apologized for anything because in his mind, he's he never... He apologize for that. He's never made a mistake. He should apologize for not apologizing for anything. I mean, that would be the first thing to do. You know, they say when you die... I already mentioned this too. You get a life review. You get a life review, and you experience all the pain that, of everybody that you hurt. <clears throat> that you hurt. Well, that's another. And I'm thinking about yeah. some of these guys in in uh, these recovery wards. You know, uh, assisted living and stuff. Where you hear them screaming in the middle of the night, all yeah. through the night. If maybe, you think that maybe really happens, not getting a preview. You know what I mean? But evidently, I, mean, I, I wouldn't evidently, wish that. I wouldn't yeah. wish that on them or, or anything. I mean, it's like oh, I would. I'm terrified of dying. Why? Because I've hurt a lot of people. Well, I think the thing of it is, though, that that the way the information is presented to us, it's the animal part of us that's afraid to die. I think that the higher nature part of consciousness, once it crosses through that membrane and is able to let go of the identification with form, that everything is, is just fine. I mean, you hear, you read uh, virtually any NDE experience that you read about, near-death experience that you read about. The person who, quote unquote, comes back describes a feeling of well-being and safety and and letting go that, that feels wonderful. So, you know, it's like Woody Allen joked, you know, I, I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> But, of course, you have to be there when it happens. And then there's, I again, I think there's a certain aspect of which once you pass through a, a membrane. You're going to want to be there when it happens. Yeah, and, and you're able to let go of form that you're just fine. But um, so we, we have this cosmic drama that's working itself out where we have the perfect representative of the American character, which has not been willing to take responsibility for for the unskillful actions that it's participated in. Everything from manifest destiny and the destruction of, of indigenous peoples to slavery, racism, those are really, I think, the fundamental dysfunctions of, of the American experiment. So let's take Vietnam, the Vietnam War, for example. John Kerry was talking about that. I sat and wept the night that that um, shock and awe was taking place in Baghdad, that that you know um, Bush and Cheney unleashed their horrors on Baghdad, because what I was witnessing was a repetition in its own with its own particulars, but a repetition of the very same thing we did in Vietnam. We precipitated a conflict that had no basis in validity or truth or reality. And, and so that's what happens when you're unwilling to take responsibility, you're unwilling to uh, own up to a mistake that's been made, is then you're doomed, as the expression goes, to repeat that history again and again and again. And that's what we'll continue to do until, uh, you know, until the average Trump voter and supporter is willing to say, even if only to themselves, you know what, I made a fundamental fuck up. I made a huge mistake. But instead of doing that, they they, they double down on on uh, a checkmate. No, you took my king. That's funny. <laughs> I'm not, not even paying attention to what you're doing. <laughs> anyway, that's um, you know, that's kind of my assessment. And so what so what does this say to the average individual person? about what they're supposed to do in response to the Trump phenomenon. And I think that depends on where you find yourself. You know, if you're in Congress, there's a 
whole set of things that quote unquote should be done but are not being done. If you're a little individual schlub out here in schlubland like you and myself, then I think what's incumbent upon us is to do what, what Trump teaches us is to do our own spiritual work, our own internal landscape needs to be tended to. And one of the more fascinating and I think difficult challenges involved in that is number one, not hating Trump and everything that he is, because then you become the very thing. I mean, just ask the, uh, the Israelis, you know, you become the thing that you despise. And, and, uh, That's why it repeats, why this cyclical, this syndromatic, this snake that eats its own tail continues to unfold in human history because we will not own up to our responsibility. Well, what do you mean? We, I mean, we's a pretty big word there, white man. Well, I'm, I, am pre, I am painting with a broad brush. I mean, there are, we've, we've all met individuals who are at varying stages of development on this particular scale that I'm creating a picture of. Um, but, you know, I, I have no particular input into doing or undoing anything that Donald Trump is doing. The only, the only thing that I have any quote unquote control over is how I process information how I process what I see occurring in the world. So if I'm able to meet a situation that presents itself in my life with the opposite of what I see Donald Trump doing, if I'm able to empathize, if I'm able to offer compassion, if I can walk in somebody else's shoes for a few minutes, if I can see something from another person's perspective, I'm doing my own work. Donald is teaching me that. Wow, it's important for me to do my own work because when I don't, look at what the consequences are. Now, whether that will equate to America surviving or not as a, a republic or whether we're just going to be another failed experiment in self-governance, who knows? And really, in a way, who cares? What, what matters is the work that's being done. I, I don't enjoy the idea that so many people, particularly my three-year-old granddaughter, will have a great deal to suffer from as a consequence of the unskillful actions of my generation and the other generations that have come before her. But again, the only input that I have over that is how I deal with my granddaughter, how I treat her, how I educate and influence her reactive behavior, how I teach her to have to take responsibility for herself. And I think if that's done by enough individuals, then, um, you know, hopefully there will be a cumulative effect and uh, some good will come of this. But I don't know. And that's another thing that I think you grasp or you try to grasp as you go through the maturation process is there has to be a certain comfort zone with don't know. Yeah. Part, of, part of the hubris of Western culture is that we think we know a lot well, more than we do. We're trying to figure out what to do about this. And, and we're really in kind of a checkmate situation here with, with Donald Trump and... Uh, what you can extrapolate that from more esoteric views, you know, is, is one thing, but pragmatically, wh where is this going? I mean, we've, we've seen a bear market, the, the uh, bull market turn into a bear market and starting to jump up and down. And, and one of the, I've said this before, I'll keep saying it again. One of the hallmarks of narcissism is the, the wake of chaos that is that they leave. Uh, and that's exactly what we're seeing here. He's he's causing chaos, and that's that is 
I don't, I don't know what could be more serious than that. You know, when, when we were approaching World War II in the midst of the Depression, things were really down. This was 80 years ago. It was part of this 80-year cycle. Things were really down. Roosevelt, who was a wealthy guy, you know, and a kind of a patriarchal kind of figure, <coughs> the thing he said was, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And that came from, I believe that came from Napoleon Hill. Napoleon Hill was his advisor. I mean, that, that's pretty incredible when you think about it, the godfather of positive mental thinking and successful thinking, successful attitudes, who actually came up with a, a root, kind of a rule and guide for you know, the rules of, of being successful and being happy was the advisor to the President of the United States. Contrast that to now, what we're hearing, and it's like, it's the inverse of that. It's like it's been turned inside out. He's not taking anybody's advice, much less somebody's advice like that. Hey, did you see that, that, that moment where that preacher who was rescued from, what was it, a Turkish prison or something, came back, and, and Trump had him at the White House there to congratulate him on on Trump's freeing him from prison. Yeah, I sort of recall that moment, yeah. yeah congratulations, I freed you from prison. Yeah. You know, what a lucky guy you are. And uh, this guy, this preacher, gets down and he, on one knee, and puts his hand on Trump's forehead figuratively. On the other hand, you know, on his knee, and says his prayer for Trump, that, it, that may God give him the wisdom to lead this country. And I thought, that's... That's, that was pretty damn cool. And so maybe because of that, I, I begin to look for the undertone. So I go, well, what's the good that could come out of this? Mm -hmm. But I think it's important that we do as you have done it so skillfully. And, and I'm amazed at your, you know, at your uh, the breadth of your, of your wisdom here on this. That this has pretty broad implications, you know, that that we're in a, at a time in our history where we've, we've never been before. There are uncharted waters. And it's getting real scary for me. Because I don't want to die. <laughs> yeah, well, of course. Especially no, not like this. Well, nobody gets out of life alive. So that's, that's certainly, maybe that's just, I don't know, maybe that's a whole other topic. Yeah, but well, I guess the wor what could be worse is it burning out. <clears throat> maybe that's what it is. Yeah, well, I don't think that, you know. I don't. I, I don't think the metaphysic of um, when you pass away, all you have left is your conscience. What What I have suggested is that I become uh, Trump's personal homeopath and is the, the physician general. I've nominated myself for that position. You know, I do these these uh, been doing these videos that I've been putting on my blog and, and YouTube, of which I'd like to make this a part of, and. Uh, it uh, this is this I think is pretty cool. What we just did today with this. Well, so, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting, and this hasn't come up yet, but what I'm suggesting also. I mean, you talked about this preacher asking that he be given the wisdom, and then you asked earlier if there's free will. Well, I happen to be of the mind. I certainly have no empirical basis for this. I have no. Um, way that I can can prove this, but based strictly on my own experience, again, like Carl Jung, I believe that uh, he developed this concept of synchronicity, which he called a causal connectivity. There's no direct cause and effect that you can see between certain events that are synchronistic, but they seem to be somehow connected on some level that is beyond the capacity of, of linear perception to understand. And I've had scores of these experiences, particularly since I sobered up. Uh, and if you're in the present moment grounded well enough to notice them, they come along all the time. Um, and, and by that, I mean that at moments when I'm looking for or, or anticipating maybe some inspiration or an intuitive thought that will affect a particular decision. People appear in my life or a book shows up or some piece of information comes my way 
in a, again, a non-causative seeming way, but I believe that that data is passed on to me by a fundamentally benign universe uh, that wants me to succeed, but because I have free will and can do, I, I, can, I can get these synchronistic pieces of information and I can either act on them or not. And I think most of us go through our lives saying, no thank you to these invitations from the universe. So in the last, say, two, three decades, I've decided to say yes. And every time I say yes, and I'm able as much as possible to get my egoic machinery out of the way, usually a solution to a particular quandary shows up that frankly, most often, wasn't even on my radar, wasn't even something that I'd considered as a potential solution. Well, so this information is probably being supplied by teachers and guides of the light to Mr. Trump, but he's chosen not to abide by them. So again, whether or not this whether or not this cosmic drama works itself yeah, it's out, bringing, but it's bringing it out, out of us, isn't it? In other words, he's, yes, he's, he's maybe causing us to be more compassionate. With we we have a prime opportunity here for spiritual growth that may not involve the survival of, of Western culture or this particular experiment in, in civilization. You can you make a sign? I mean, I've got some of those those stencil letters that we can start making some signs. The end is near. <laughs> How about, you know what I wanted to do is is have a T-shirt made that says free will and give them out to uh, where's the proof for free will yeah. and give them out to prisoners. Well, you know, again, we, we live in a, in, a, in a time, we live in a culture that's built on the hubris of technology and science. And while technology and science has made tremendous inroads in improving human existence, we think of it as the end all and the be all. But, you know, Albert Einstein said... And I'm paraphrasing here, but oh, don't, don't paraphrase that old problem. The mind that got got us into a particular problem is not the mind that's going to get us out. So if we think that science and technology is going to be the answer to all the problems that science and technology have created, I think that's short sighted. Don't talk to me about science and technology. Okay, I won't. If anybody should talk about science and technology, it should be me. Well, we're listening. Well, I Einstein is a fraud. This, this whole this whole EM EM E equals MC squared. M if you're gonna <laughs> if you're going to criticize it, you have to be able to say it. Energy times mass squared. Something like yeah. energy, energy equals, equals matter mass. times the speed of light squared. Yeah. Okay. Well, there there is the constant speed of light. MC squared, the constant speed of light squared. Light is a light speed is a constant, but it's not a constant. It's not a constant. Light can go slower, it can go faster, and, and I believe that energy can be transmitted immediately through any space by demonstration of what they call quantum entanglement. You separate a particle into two particles, and they stay in sync. So what you know. What the hell is that? What the hell is that? Show, sh should we uh, pause this thing and take a well, break? Well, what about the idea, if, before we pause it, what about the idea that if time slows down, the closer you get to the speed of light, if you reach the speed of light, then time stops, theoretically. So light really isn't traveling anywhere. It isn't going anywhere because when you're from the perspective of a proton, um, a photon, there's no such there's no such thing as time. It's not light's not moving anywhere <laughs> because from the again from oh, the great. from the photon's perspective, nothing's changing. That's, that's, that's brilliant. Not my idea, but well, you know that gravity affects time. Did you know that? I know that gravity is the opposite of comedy, but levity. yes, of course, levity. Yeah. No, I know that. Yeah, gravity uh, definitely, according to Einstein. <laughs> Einstein never got to that. Yeah. If you, I guess, if you fold space <laughs> in your wallet, yeah, then you can spend you it anywhere. Of a credit card, and you can spend it anywhere. I don't think we should post this and get some comments. <laughs>